Man, thanks for crunchy data. I, I, I feel inadequate because, I mean, you got Sean Gorman and Regina Obi and everybody's, and, and I feel like I'm in the middle <laughs> of this excitement, but here we go. I'm going to cover something completely different. So if you guys have got a few minutes, we're going to talk about a, uh, a county implementation of post-GIS and QGIS and a little bit of everything. So I, uh, excuse the accent, I am not from the Midwest, not from the West Coast, but from Chattanooga. So um, I've been a consultant now for, uh, let's see, I've owned North River for probably 13 years. Uh, history in the federal government, that's how I got into mapping. So I worked at TVA here in, in Chattanooga. They've got like the second oldest mapping um, program in the nation. So I kind of learned my chops there and started using open source about eight years ago. I was working on a project uh, way south of here doing a dressing and the group was using post GIS and I was a uh, complete, you know, I mean, I grew up using ESRI products, so I, I know my way around, but didn't know about this thing post GIS. And so suddenly I started learning and, um, you know, out of that QGIS kind of popped up. Um, I think I was using QGIS a little bit before post, but, uh, and currently I'm on the QGIS US board and I'm trying to get thrown off the OSGO US board, but uh, Guido won't throw me off. So float back to 2018 and I go to St. Louis and this is before the 2019 talk and I run into this guy, Chad Howard and Chad, we started talking and, and Chad had QGIS, um, He'd been he'd been using it, and you know there he works at a nine one one for Henry County, Tennessee. So if you go to Nashville, hang a left and drive about an eh, hour and a half, you run into Henry County, maybe an hour, and uh, it's a little little bit out, a little bit further away than I travel. I think for me it's like four and a half five hours to get there. But uh, you know we started talking about you know what's going on, and so Henry County is pretty cool. Uh, world's biggest fish fry, uh, as evidenced, which I don't think they had this year because of COVID. And also, 116th or 18th Eiffel Tower, you can go visit the Eiffel Tower uh, in Paris, Tennessee. So, uh, you know, we're kind of international here in the South. You know, we got Athens and Paris and Rome and all the good stuff. So, it's pretty rural, 32,000 residents. You're looking at like 25,000-ish addresses, fairly large. Um, so if you ever walk in to a small government, you know, you're going to find commercial GIS software because that's what you do. Uh, you, you, you go out, you usually buy a, uh, you know, a yellow tremble unit of some type or source. You get, you get a, uh, an Esri basic or whatever they call it now, license, and, uh, you know, your budget's are all over the place. You, you may have a well-funded city or county, uh, you may not, but, you know, one way or the other, they're making stuff happen. And if you look at a 911, especially here at Henry County, um, they're in charge of address assignment. So when you build a house or you, you do something, they're going to show up and say, okay, you're at 123 Main Street. And, you know, that's a little bit important to know where you're at and to know your address. And they also make maps, they relay data to the, the, um, the dispatch that makes, you know, make sure 911 gets, you know, ambulances get to your front door. And they may be the GIS for the county, you know, they, they could be it. And uh, Chad, who I'll reverence a lot, he's actually texting me while I'm talking. Um, you know, he, he's kind of the man there in Henry County getting stuff done and just, I did this talk and I didn't even include this, but just in case, you know, because because you can have international everybody, uh, an address or at least an address from the U.S. standard, um, it's more of a, it, it's not really a location so much as a way to tell you how to get somewhere. So in this case, you'll, you'll see me talk a lot about addresses and I'm going to run through this in QGIS also, but generally if you look an address at least uh, here in the U.S., especially Henry County, you know, you've got a street number, uh, which will be one, two, three, or some random, you know, 
not necessarily random, but it but it gives an inkle it gives an indication of distance up the street, you know, a street name. What is it? Is it a street? Is it a circle? Um, you know, city, state, zip code. So addressing is pretty important. And you know, the job I worked on several years ago, we were working on a, in, a, in a place with no address. Uh, so it was all directional. So you just, you know, go down the street, turn left and keep going until you see a tree. Um, it's important to have addresses, you know, especially now during COVID. I mean, you guys have ordered from Amazon here lately and, uh, you know, gotten stuff to your front door. So, <clears throat> so here's what was happening in Henry County. And here's kind of how we got into the open source uh, thing. You know, as part of my gig here at North River, I seem to be migrating a lot of people out of commercial GIS software. Uh, and, and a lot of it's price, some of it's price driven, some of it's not, some of it, they just want to expand what they're doing. I think the QG, I think QGIS and PostGIS are much better. So I'm all gung ho for doing that. And so in Henry County, they had a couple of copies of Art Basic, uh, Art GIS Basic or what, whatever you call it, Art View. I'm just gonna call it Art View. Uh, they had ArcGIS online. They had a, a um, I think a Panasonic Toughbook laptop or something very close to that. And they were working out of a, you know, an, an, an Esri format, a file-based geodatabase. And the field work involved, you know, you took the data, the laptop, everything out. You assigned an address. You came back. If somebody needed data, you ran it over to them. You know, you took the USB drive, you handed it off. And, um, you know, it's a usable setup. A lot of people do this. Um, I know it, it's a little bit scary to think about, but it, it can work. They were making it work, but they needed to expand. And uh, to expand, you know, if you start looking at expanding in a commercial software realm like that, it, it, it gets expensive and they're on a tight budget. So talk to Chad. And we continued the conversation after fos 4 g uh, North America and St. Louis for a couple of months. And so the plan was, you know, get a server up and running. What do we need for a server? Um, Chad had a, a, a server in house so we can install, you know, what we needed to on it. I think we did uh, 1804, the, the Ubuntu 1804 server install. And, and we installed PostGIS and PostgreSQL and GeoServer. And the one commercial piece of this thing we used was Fulcrum, uh, the Fulcrum app. And that was really the only commercial piece we got out of this uh, that, that we had to purchase. And he handled that part. We got it installed on the phones. Uh, migrating data out of an ESRI format is insanely easy these days. I mean, there, there's tools you pull it into QGIS, you can shove it into uh, Post pretty easy. Um, you know, we set up all the client computers. They're a mix of Mac and PC. so. Um, there was a lot of stuff we could do there, uh, you know, getting everything installed. We did some training, not much. I mean, it, Chad had sat in on a class I had done. He kind of knew what was going on. Work with it for a few months, work out the bugs, and try to make this easy, um, as easy as we could. It was a little bit daunting. I mean, this is the biggest thing I think I had tried to tackle, um, you know, in dealing with a 911. Now, Tennessee, we actually do pretty good in the digital space. We've got LIDAR free for download. We, we've done a pretty good job since 96 of mapping the state. And they also came up with their own uh, next generation 911 database. Now, this came into effect before the NINA uh, 911 database. And I'll talk about that coming up. Um, so the Tennessee 911 setup, do a small screenshot of kind of the test data that I'm working with. Um, they have an ESN, which is an emergency service network. And it's a series of polygons to kind of tell you who's gonna to come to you, you know, if something bad happens. They have addresses and they have road center lines. And that's it, you know, you got three layers. Really the three most important things you could have um, for accounting. And that's what we were working with. So it was pretty easy, you know, shove three layers into post GIS and get going. Uh, the kicker is I probably should have read the standard before I did it. <laughs> so we kind of went, you know, let's run this a couple of times before we get it perfected. And 
the uh, the NG nine one one standard, you've got about one hundred and three attributes over three layers. Um, from there, you know, thirty one attributes are really kind of what all the state cares about, and out of that, really, the center line and the address are the two most important. Um, the rest of the other 70-ish that you're dealing with are sub-addressing and networking and building descriptions, road descriptions, all that good stuff. So, uh, you know, and the entire reason this is happening is you want, you know, emergency vehicles, you want mail, you want your pizza, you want everything delivered to where you are. So, you know, you want that unique identifier with, you um, on your, on your address, on your house, on your apartment, wherever you may be, you want somebody to be able to find you. So that's kind of important. So what we did, you know, like I said, we got uh, Ubuntu 18.04 installed. We got Postgres installed. Um, we migrated stuff out. We got everything installed. We got Fulcrum purchased. There were a few hiccups. Um, there was actually a unique ID attached to the address, and I... Uh, Amazingly made that uh, change a lot. <laughs> so our first uh, upload to the state, they, they weren't very happy about that and we had to go back and fix it, but it was, it was a pretty easy fix. Um, once we got the data in, uh, the whole kicker then was how do we make this easier? And so if you look at the database and I include a screenshot here of QGIS, you can see that, um, you know, you would put in uh, as we're looking here, this is Elkhorn Road. And so you would put in, you know, the street number. Uh, Chad would go out and pre-measure in a vehicle. They would run from intersection, uh, an intersection up to the location. That would give him a number. Uh, he would put in this, the center line, the, the type of road that it was, uh, the, the type of center line, whether it was a road, a street, or whatever. And then he would start filling out information, the city, the the, the uh the town it was located in, if it was outside the city limits of Paris, um, you know, and all this stuff starts happening. And, you know, I, I love post GIS, but man, sometimes uh, <laughs> I kind of, I kind of struggle a little bit, but I started learning about triggers and everything else and functions. And so we started building a lot of triggers to start trying to automatically capture data. And one of the triggers we built was simply if you drop an address, grab the ESN and pull it in. Once that's pulled in, another trigger works to concatenate the street address. Um, if you put in the city, let that pull in the zip code. Um, also, record lat long. You know, we, we want to make this as effortless as we can. And so I kept working and, you know, talking to Chad and talking to different people. How do we make this simple? And so the triggers kept expanding. Uh, we found location, we, we found places to store. When we made an update, fire off a trigger, record the time. Uh, who did the update? Well, let's concatenate the address. Let's fix the addresses to make them a little bit cleaner. Let's assign the OIR ID and make sure that doesn't replicate. Let's assign the XY location, you know, both lat long, state plane. Uh, as you can see in this screenshot, we even have a Z built in also. And so I started really kind of pushing a little bit. And at this point, QGIS was just moving over to version three. And moving to version three was a huge jump from two. You know, it was almost like we started talking about this one month. We were at 2.16 or 2.18. And then suddenly we're at three. And um, three brought a whole new host of things on board that we could do. So we had forms in two, um, in version two of QGIS, but like Jessica was talking about and Cliff was talking about also this morning, uh, we started building out forms. And so what I ended up doing was just embedding tables within the database. And so you would take what essentially would be like a directional that you would apply to a street, north, south, east, west, apply that, pull that into QGIS to build a form uh, for pick lists. So you don't have to do a lot of, you know, we want to reduce the amount of typing. Um, so we start building forms every, you know, form everything, put everything we can into forms. Um, one of the things we did work with, and Chad helped me with this, 
was actually QGIS, you can build your own menu. So you can go into QT Designer very effortlessly and build a menu. And we felt like maybe a little bit of a cleaner menu where things were more in order to how he was used to seeing them. So you could go in and pick, you know, uh, the type of road, the number, the apartment, which side of the street it was on, what pre-directional. Um, you're almost into building plug-in territory at this point, but it's fairly easy to build a menu. So we built that. And uh, what's also really weird, so we, we were kind of breaking new ground in the state because everybody's running, you know, commercial GIS software. And we're over here in the corner running, uh, running our open source setup. And the state pushes out their aerial imagery through an ARC service, uh, ARC server. You just, you can pull it in. Uh, so they actually, there is a image service for counties that is only for counties, not for private citizens. They can pull it in. Um, Chad's actually kind of turned into a, a guinea pig for the state because he's, he's using, you know, QGIS now everywhere. And so they send him links. Can you test this out? Can you make sure it works? Uh, I actually pull in the state layer from the assessor's website. And so we get a free image layer uh, in, the, in the state of Tennessee. We update every four years, uh, the image layer, or, or we fly one quarter of the state every year. So in four years, we get a fairly new, you know, view of the state. Um, so the nice thing was, so we get all this set up and we're only dealing with three layers. I mean, it's not like we're, we're pushing post GIS that much with three layers set up but chad's got a lot of data uh, they got a lot of data floating around henry county um, what about building footprints what about storm shelters what about flood data uh, what about fire hydrants uh, points of interest that he has uh, bridges he actually had an intern come in last year and do all the bridges and so they you know gave the intern qgis and said here go forth and and uh, map bridges and uh, pulling in the lidar data you know, anything you want, it's now centrally stored, it's centrally backed up, and everybody in the office now has access to it because we're dealing with free software. So you can hand off, you know, QGIS uh, to the emergency director. You can hand it off to the 911 director. You can give it to whoever you want to give it to. Let this thing hit the server, and uh, things are good. Things are easier, we think. Um, the coolest part of this whole thing, and I can't say how cool this is. Um, so the state, so we did an install. Uh, you know, we, we get everything installed, we're running, and then just as I'm leaving, you know, feeling fairly victorious from Chad's end, Chad yells, hey, how do we deliver this to the state? And I went, what? He said, yeah, we got we to gotta shove this into the state's ESRI database. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know that was a thing. And so we talked to the guys at the state and they let us deliver a geo package. So for the last two years, every night, Chad's computers dump um, out of the post GIS database, uh, these three layers to a geo package. It gets uploaded to the state. It gets absorbed into their ESRI network. Uh, I can't say enough good things about OGR, Google, GDAL. Uh, two years through upgrades and through everything else, the script has run nonstop. We've never had to worry about it. We've never had to do anything. Every night stuff just gets delivered. Man, <laughs> if everything was that good. Um, so yeah, this thing runs, you know, uh, we're into two years into this. So conceptually what we built over some, you know, work and, and this and that over the last year, uh, two years, really, Chad goes out with Fulcrum, records data. Now, this was way before, like, Qfield was just kind of coming into play and, and input from Lutra Consulting. Um, wasn't really a thing, so we were, you know, we were still using use Fulcrum. Fulcrum does a whole lot of really cool things. Take the Fulcrum data, we feed it into QGIS, Chad checks it, he shoves it into the post GIS, and then from there, he has an online map that's getting fed through uh, shapefile updates. He's also feeding the CAD system that the dispatchers use also from PostGIS. Now, GeoServer, we really haven't done a lot with. We got it installed and we, we've 
gotten questions, you know, what can we do? Can we push out live layers? We can, we just haven't done it yet. Yet, that's probably gonna come next. Um, so once we got this thing installed, we started going back and looking at the data. Because once you have all your data packed into this database, you can do all kinds of cool things. And one of the things we did was, where have you fat fingered possibly the name of a street on the address point? And so maybe you spelled Maine uh, M-I-A-N versus M-A-I-N. And uh, let's compare that to the road that you addressed it to. So everything was a blue circle popped up, had some kind of weird anomaly. Now, 90% of that anomaly was ARC adding a space after uh, some of the attributes. And so we had some data cleanup after this to, to go fix. And, you know, you can set up a view. So this was set up as a view. It just automatically updates and post. Um, any place you put in two address points on top of each other, put a red circle around it. You know, going back to Jessica's talk, you can set up a, uh, a QGIS symbology layer, embed that into, into uh, post. And so I've got this kind of permanently done. So anytime something weird happens, you get a, a circle or, a, you know, a red circle, a blue circle, something like that pops up and happens. Um, the other thing we started looking at, so PG routing, I am not good with yet. So we were using grass, um, uh, the grass tool set actually to do some routing. And so we built a model in, in QGIS uh, and I, built the model, sent it off to Chad, he adjusted it. And so he started looking at two and five mile drive distances from fire departments. And we were able to make a map and do all this, you know, pretty cool stuff. So if you're in red, if your street is in red, you're more than five miles away from fire department. Uh, is that good or bad? Eh, I don't know, it just, you are. So we were able to look at that and see, you know, who's being affected, what can they do to fix it? You know, do they need to redraw the ESN? Do they need to build another fire station? You know, anything you want to, I don't know exactly what the answer is, but we're able to do it. So they had this problem, we fixed it, you know, using software. My goal is to try to do this in PG routing. And I know I can, I just hadn't got to it yet, but it's under development. I, I think I can get this to work fairly effortlessly in PG uh, routing. So the other thing I did just for fun <laughs> was I didn't do an import open street map people uh, before y'all try to you know storm the gates and and uh, chase me down but I did pull Chad's data and take a look at it from an open street map standpoint so in the bottom you see this nice color image that's Google Maps if you look to the top you'll see open street map and in about 40 hours ish, a little bit less probably than that, I went through and compared, just did a visual check, gridded off the area, and looked to see what roads were missing out of OSM or what could be added, what could be changed, what was wrong. And so we went through and updated uh, with, you know, as, as well as we could the OpenStreetMap layer, thinking that this is eventually going to make it out. You know, there's enough commercial interest now in, in OpenStreetMap that maybe this road changes and maybe this other stuff will eventually migrate up the street, you know, upstream Facebook and, and whoever else. And maybe Google's watching OSM. Maybe they'll see that we, you know, added more roads to Winding, Ray, winding Way. Currently, they haven't because I just made this slide like yesterday. So, but yeah, stuff's happening. So it's working and this is pretty smooth. Uh, it's a pretty smooth setup. Even through the, you know, the QGIS upgrades, PostGIS is really the stable end of this. We set it up, we set up the, the, the triggers, the functions. It's just working. Um, actually, I probably need to update to a newer version, but it's working. So what if you're outside of Tennessee? What does that, you know, what does all this mean to you? Well, there's a NINA standard and the NINA standard is more of a national uh, approach to this. So the thought is that somebody in, you know, Colorado could share data with somebody in Maryland. You know, you, you've, you've got this national standard. If you adhere to it, the data is, you know, can be passed around. It's probably, you know, built with more of an ESRI thought in mind, but they've published, much like Tennessee did, they published the model. So you can go dig through the NINA standard, look at it, 
and there's no reason you can't do this in QGIS and PostGIS. Uh, absolutely not. So uh, there's more working parts in the NINA standard. You know, Tennessee, we've got three layers and NINA, you got a lot. There's a, there's a lot more stuff. Uh, I've started kind of trying to build that out in PostGIS uh, using Chad's data as kind of a guinea pig. And I've had some other people call and ask, you know, can we do it? We can do it. There, there's no reason you can't do this in open source because I mean we're delivering to a commercial database we're doing all this stuff using open tools and open source and it's a good thing so um, so the projects really had three, three phases you know from my end the first phase was just make it work uh, the second phase Chad had bought a new server we went back and looked at you know what QAQC checks could we do new ideas and for this point, I'm just going to shove it all on GitHub. Um, I've never really published a project up there. So I've published the Tennessee stuff and I'm publishing the Nina stuff as I add to it. So uh, hopefully, as I delve into building a plugin, maybe we can build a plugin for the Nina standard. It actually would make this a little bit easier uh, to enter data and maintain data. There's no reason this won't work. So with that being said, hey, so here it is. So funny story, Chad. So Chad's like texting me like crazy and I'm ignoring him. Chad, I'm not ignoring you like on purpose. Uh, there's so much I can do <laughs> during the day. So here's the funny thing. So we pulled all their data in. At least I thought this was funny. Uh, I made a visit up to Chad uh, a few months back. And uh, you can see we've pulled in the LIDAR data. So this is Tennessee's LIDAR data. Uh, you can see quite a bit. I mean, it's, it's good looking data. The funny thing is, or at least it was funny to me, I think anecdotally, uh, Chad always said that this area was the highest point in Henry County. I'll probably get a text for that one, but this is one of the old, I think the old middle school or something. And over sits a hill. Like when you're in, when you're in Paris, you see the hill. Uh, after looking at the LIDAR data, technically the highest point is uh, out here in a field. <laughs> there, there's a whole grove of trees uh, north of town. This is like 653 feet above sea level. And uh, the other area is not. And that, to me, that made me chuckle. But luckily there's no signs up, so nothing has to get changed. Uh, the other kicker is you'll see the blue circles um, showing up in here. And if I just go look using, uh, I bookmarked a few things so I wouldn't mess up. Uh, you can see here that I've blue circled this address because it's actually volunteer. and We've got two ends uh, built into it. So, you know, it's a quick, easy fix to pull stuff in. Um, plus you got LIDAR and, you know, it's, when I built the hillshade, or actually, I think when I mosaiced all the DEM stuff together, I was playing around with it, and I should have used a different um, uh, way to pull it all together because you can see a little bit of the contouring. But um, yeah, so that's it. And so if we were actually able to, let's see, can I shrink that down? If we just go in and look at a random address, and this is actually running off a little node uh, virtual box up on the net somewhere. Uh, I didn't feel safe enough to log into Chad server and actually pull up the live data, but you can just see all the stuff that they're capturing. You know, the editor was Chad. When was this last updated? The attribution was updated on 2019-012. Um, you know, and, and there's also been more stuff. Chad's also went and scanned uh, the blueprints for the school. I mean, now that they have this GIS running, he's actually went in and mapped all the classrooms, uh, geo-referencing the, the blueprints now with the, with the data that we have. So things are getting better. Um, the other thing is too, so while he's been doing that, I have been doing uh, more stuff. So same data set, a little bit smaller running on a, a Docker image here on my machine. Um, thank you, Cartoza, for the PostGIS Docker image, but I want to make this a little bit better. And to make this a little bit better, I also want to use 
the comment field and actually go through the standard and start filling out. So if you're looking at fields in the data and you go, what in the world is name, the name of the thoroughfare or, you know, or throughway only. So you kind of know what's going on. You've got at least some type of metadata to look at. Uh, if I go in and do some edits and we actually, so I'm adding more and more drop down lists so we can go do, you know, things. The other thing, and I was going to show you uh, the custom menu, but I kind of screwed that up this morning, was I can go in now and using the relation widget in QGIS, if we're looking at a house and saying that's a, you know, a family related structure, I can click family and then narrow down this to an apartment, bus, cabin, you know, duplex. If we're looking at agricultural, I should have really changed this and go back and look. You can see now I've only got an agricultural pick list. So make it a little bit easier to give you an idea of what the structure is. So, um, you know, and picking your unit, if, if you're, if you're, looking at a, at a multi-story structure, let's pick what we're looking at, um, pre-direction, pre-type, uh, dressing. Uh, you know, there's quite a bit. And one of the QAQC checks I wanna do is actually now going back and looking at um, attaching the structure to the road. So there is a segment ID that gets assigned to the street center line. Uh, I don't think I have that. I've kind of been building and destroying data like crazy in this test thing, but filling out the segment ID, assigning the segment ID to the road. So then you can ask, you know, going into the back to the database idea, how many houses do I have on this road? Um, I need to update stuff. We, we need to uh, look at routing. You know, can I, can I route to the access point or is there uh, you really need to go into the back side of the building versus walking in through the front door more for emergency services. So uh, my ultimate goal is to try to get everything filled out. Uh, you know, go from just filling out 30 things to using the database, using QGIS, fill out everything that we can fill out, have a fully, a pretty flush data set built here. Um, you know, it's just a really nice project. I mean, it's not, it's uh, not anything flashy or anything really groundbreaking, but the fact that we're using this open source software, uh, using Postgres, using QGIS and, and running through all this stuff um, to maintain addressing, you know, and eventually this gets uploaded into different systems. We're, we're touching at least two or three different softwares and it's not a compatibility issue at all um, to do this. So, my plans, after having shoved all this up on GitHub and you know playing around with it, I've got install scripts for the Tennessee database done. You can build it pretty easy. I want to put a database up actually with all the layers built in from QGIS so you don't have to worry about symbology, which will also give you the drop-down lists and all the other stuff so you don't have to rebuild that from scratch. Um, getting street center line data in, you know, didn't take that long, less than 40 hours uh, into OSM. And that was mostly just recentering what was already there. Um, work on PG routing. I want to bring in the Tennessee's LIDAR data to actually start assigning elevations to the houses, uh, to the to the address point itself. That's one of the things built into the Tennessee standard that we haven't done. It's I believe it's also part of the NINA standard. Um, I love fulcrum, but we've also got Q-field and input maybe we could use those for something uh, and, and actually, you know, maybe fork off the database, go out in the field, come back in and pull that back uh, straight in. Uh, work on some more QAQC checks and, and um, you know, more easily align the center line ID with the addresses. Roads do occasionally change. So in those changes, you want that change to reflect back up to the address layer. So, um, and I think really, getting that done will we'll add a lot of um, safety or, or sanity into the database because if we can more easily say address you're on this road and then have the address pull all that information in from the street you know itself things are good so 
in summary, hey, this works. Uh, we all know it works. That's why we're all here. But uh, it can provide a pretty rock solid solution for a county. You know, be it nine one one, be it another um, uh, entity within the county, you can use it. And standards are your friends. You know, big shout out to Tennessee and Nina for publishing their standard and you know for letting us you know dig through it and look at it. Um, and, uh, you know, because of that, I think we can get this into PostGIS and, you know, make it fairly easy and support your local Fos4G software. Dadgummit. That was some, you know, QGIS has saved us. Even in the middle of this, we hit this massive bug. I had a slide and I took it out. We hit this massive bug and emailed a developer um, and they fixed it. You know, we, we got it fixed in the next uh, uh, service pack release for QGIS. You know, they, they worked on it and it was a pretty sticky uh, bug. We, we were having some issues with geo package where columns were shifting and uh, they they got in there and fixed it. So um, Chad, I know you've been texting me. Thanks. And my cat who didn't get up here with me. I've got this geriatric cat running around, but she did not want to be part of the Zoom session. So that's kind of it. Um, questions, angst, anger. Is there anything else you'd like to see or see me screw up? Thanks, Randy. We have just a few minutes for questions because I think the next, if I'm not mistaken, the next question session is in six minutes. Oh, okay. Crap. <laughs> I think. Let me just make sure. No, no, it's not. See, I. Okay, good. Okay. No, wait. <sighs> no, right. It's not. It's not. It's in 20 minutes. So that's good. Oh, sweet. Um, okay. So we got time. So we did have some questions that came in and cool. I'll ask them of you now. Well, actually, I have a question for my, since I'm the host, I get to yes. ask my question first. Do it, man. I did know, notice that you have almost like a versioning system, like you have the last edited date, which I'm assuming is a trigger. Yeah. And the user is probably a trigger to like pull the database user and insert that into the field. Yeah. Do you, do you actually do full on versioning or is it just last update? It's been last update, but I have considered trying to do some kind of versioning to at least keep all the edits or to at least keep the deletions or keep something going on. So, yeah, it's just been last in. Um, okay. Last edit. So I, I probably need to, but hadn't got to that point yet. So if right, anybody has any suggestions, please yell. <laughs> well, there that was done. a question about that earlier, um, I think, uh, yeah. about Jessica's talk. Like, can you do versioning and how do you do versioning? Yeah. First yeah. Yes. And she yeah. kind of answered it saying, you know, you build separate tables that on edit or update on update, you copy the old feature and put it into a table yeah. and assign whatever metadata you want. But anyway, no, back, back in the day when we were running, I mean, this is, this is a long time back and not post GIS, but, but back in the old arc workstation days, one of the things you had was, was, you know, you knew where you were working and you knew what you were doing and really to me, that was always the safest way to work and not really worrying about this Esri idea of versioning stuff. And, you know, you got to have a version. You got to do this. You got to do that. Eh, no, not really. <laughs> right. Know what you're doing. <laughs> um, okay, next one from an anonymous attendee. Does the county use a commercial CAD RMS program? Uh, yes. And I think, because Chad is sitting here texting me, um, they use a commercial system called ID. I think it's um, ID Networks. Okay, Chad just texted me. So that commercial system uses shape files. Um, and so once every so often, Chad will export a shape file out, take that and flush that into the, the CAD system. Um, so we're actually doing two exports. We're doing one export to the state 911 and we're doing one export into the CAD setup. So cool. Okay, yep. next one's from Regina. Regina says, how did you get those dropdowns in QGIS? Looks cool. Man. Now, I also have a question around that. Are those drop, is there a way to try the, to tie those dropdowns into like, let's say you used an enumeration in the yeah. Postgres database. Like, could you, if you made an enumeration, is QGIS smart enough to say, oh, here's the enumeration, I'm gonna do that? I you know? don't think so. Okay. I don't think, but so in QGIS, if you right click on a layer and you go to forms, it used to be called widgets. And let's look at um, something fairly easy like type. Uh, so what I'm doing, I'm loading the, uh, I've, I've got a type table 
that I shove into the database that I just build and set off the side that comes out of the standard. From there, I set a key column of type and a value column of description. And so that will give you the drop down list to uh, from there. It's, it's very similar to what, you know, the, the SRI end of doing domains and subtypes, but I feel like this is a lot, this is a lot better. So if I go down and look at the type, here's every street type you could possibly have. And now sorted correctly in 316, I think in back in 312 or 310, it wasn't sorting correctly, but um, yeah, so you can pull all that in. But yeah, it's, it's really easy to do. And the nice thing is with, let me show you this right here real quick. Um, if I look at the structure domain, I can actually pull in the same table and I go back and look at, uh, oh, where's that, where's that? Structure type. I'm actually referencing that structure domain table down here. And so it's, it's a value relation table and you can, drive, you can do a drive down, essentially a drive down list. You can, you can pick one thing and have that, you know, pressure you into doing another, another pick. So cool. Yeah. Okay. N now that also made me think of, a, oh, I think I forgot it though. Yeah. <laughs> I, too, too long went on. I'll try to remember it again um, okay. while we ask you the next question from Robert. You mentioned relations in QGIS. Has anyone got PostgreSQL and NUMS to work in a similar fashion? Ooh, I don't know. That also <laughs> goes out to the people. Um, that also goes out to the people in Discord or in the regular chat. If you've done it, yeah. I think Robert would like to hear about it. All right, you ready? Yeah. This one's from Jessica. Ooh. Randy. Have you been approached by any other county since doing this? Just wondering what the reception has been if you've tried to present this info to others in the same industry who have traditionally not been into open source. So yeah, weird story. There are a couple of counties. There's one guy over from Chad, Ed Hawkins. Um, Ed is, Ed's kind of tooling away on his own, driving towards this. He's kind of doing it a little bit, a little bit differently. Um, and where we're, we're doing it, but he's using QGIS and, and PostGIS and geo packaging and a lot of stuff. Uh, some guys further south down in Georgia gave me a shout one day, and they they're curious about doing this also. They're they're in an art shop, but feel like you know they could you know possibly leverage QGIS to do the exact same thing because really it's all about the data. You know, it's it's not so much software as it is good clean data with the correct addressing information on it. So, yeah, uh, hopefully more people will, because I think it's a good, it's a good spot for this type of setup. So, all right, next one from Caesar is, or I don't know if I should be saying it, Cesar, it might be Cesar, probably is Cesar. Um, he has a suggestion for you, which is for audit and history, you can use a plugin for QGIS and a set of triggers for Postgres and it's called pg-history-viewer. And he puts it in the GitHub ah, link. I will copy that and I put that into. I didn't know that. So now cool. Yeah, I'll take a look at it. Yeah. So there you go. Awesome. I still want to remember my question. <laughs> oh, now I remember it. I remember it. So you know how you put those descriptions in um, yes. for the tables? Does yes. that actually populate comments into the Postgres database? Yes. No way. That's what, that's exactly how I did it because I didn't know I was actually somebody either on the PG, uh, the post GIS list or something went into an Epic rant. I can't remember where I saw it of maybe it was a blog article of why don't people use the comment fields? And I was going, there's a comment field. And I went in and looked and went, oh my God, I could fill out a comment field for the table for everything. And so QGIS will recognize that and pull that in. So all this stuff is stored on the table. Right. But as like the table metadata, not actually yeah. in the table. Yeah, as the table, yeah, as the table metadata. So we've offloaded this in the post. And so it is it make it makes my metadata uh, slightly loving heart happy. <laughs> No, that's, I mean, that's awesome because also if you export your schema, your database schema, you've already got, you've got a, all the comments yep. in there to describe what all the fields are. 
Yes. And that, that's that makes, so nice. Man, it makes everything so much easier because there's so much stuff in here. I look and go, what are they? Oh my God, what do they, what do they mean by this? And I can just quickly go in here and look and go, oh, you know, that's, that's exactly, I mean, copy and pasted from the PDF standard into here. So. Right. And it now, it, but it's backed up with your database. It lives with your database. It travels with the data. Yeah. That's so nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty nice. Yeah. I like that. All right. I think, uh, let me see. Are there any other questions? Was that to me? Let's see if I got a question. I don't see any other questions. Let's see if in there's. Cool. Oh, yeah. So PostGIS. So Huey's asking, will PostGIS store metadata? Um, the metadata we're talking about here is in PostgreSQL itself. You can give a comment on a column or on a table. Like you can comment almost any object in Postgres and um, it'll do that. Your question about will it store the spatial metadata? I don't know if QGIS will export that. And you would probably have to make another table yeah. that store the metadata about the different tables. Yeah, Q, QGIS will store like a, a, a Dublin core style metadata. It's not FGDC. It's not the FGDC standard, but you can you can shove, you know, metadata into here, but it doesn't really reside in the database. So I will... I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I don't think so. I think you'd have to make another table to put that in. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. Postgres doesn't have any underlying way, nor does PostGIS, right? I mean, yeah. you could copy, but there's, it would be easy to write a little JavaScript or any PHP or Python function to auto generate Yeah. using PostGIS functions, right? Or a JSON blob, right? You yeah. could do any yeah. of those things and auto generate it every night. Yeah, right. you know, and I think too, like even think about metadata. If you could, if you, if I could tackle a little bit more of storing the changes that happen here, um, use the time functionality now to look at look at stuff over time, and you know what has changed in the city or what was, what addresses went away, what stayed. Mm. You know, there's a whole lot that can be done. Right. So, so, yeah, I, Huey, you'll talk to Paul about that one. He's going on in a discussion in Discord. But we had Chad show up. You must have uh -oh. told him what was going on because Chad is now an anonymous attendee. Oh, no. He said, most agencies in Tennessee, at least, have been drinking the Esri Kool-Aid so long <laughs> that they think that it's the only thing out there and they're scared of not having tech support. Right? So yeah. I think, I think, well, would you want to comment on that? Well, I mean, that, that's probably the number one question you get from a lot of people is, you know, how are we going to get support? And, you know, I use Chad's example of we hit a bug, we contacted the developers, they got it fixed. Now, we, we, you know, you could have thrown money at it and got it done. But I feel like this, the community, as I tell people, I'll do an install, I'll support it, I'll answer your phone calls whenever. If you don't want me to support it, join the users list, get involved in the community. I mean, there's a lot of smart people out there and hire a developer. If that doesn't work, track somebody down and, and, and make it work. But there's plenty of support options. I mean, there's a ton of support options for this, but people are scared because they see open source and they, I guess they imagine, you know, some kind of weird shareware or something they did 20 years ago, but it's so much more than that. And you just have to, you know, people just have to learn it's a learning experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. And, and I think there are more and more, especially in the spatial realm. I mean, it's been in the larger open source community. There have been, you know, companies that have grown up to support open stuff. I think we're seeing yeah. more of that in the, in the, the phosphor G yeah. realm. So, yeah. So, all right. Anywho, awesome. So I don't think I have any more questions. Anyone in the audience have any more questions? We all good? All right. Cool. With that, thank you, Randy. That was really interesting. And it was, again, a, a further reinforcement of the stuff that Jessica talked about this morning yeah. about you can build the whole, you can reproduce the whole stack using open source software. And yeah. some yeah. things you can get in here that you can't get elsewhere. So yeah, I think it's a better setup, but that's just me. So yeah. Anyway, well, cool. Good people. Thank you. Wait, I had one more though. I, oh. I know you said it wasn't free, right? Because yeah. software is never free. Just because yeah. it's, it's free as in beer, it's free as in freedom. It's never free as in beer, right? Yeah. Um, because you need someone to support it, that other question. But the other thing that people forget about 
is being able to automate with standard tools rather than having to go through QGIS and do those things every night. Like how much time do you believe you've saved the county <clears throat> in automating, having cron jobs running to do that geo package every night or that you oh, wouldn't man. have been able to do without the stuff being in a database? I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's crazy when you think about it. Like I said, you know, this, this cron job's been running two years nonstop and, and right. hasn't flinched. And it's never been a question of a couple of times, hey, the cron job didn't run, but it was because some other weird, wacky something happened, but, but not because the software failed right. at all. So, and yeah, I mean, there, there's a huge savings, I think, that comes down to there, there's, you know, there's more money to do other stuff with. So with the money they're saving, we can do more to flush out better, you know, a better database for the county. So. Oh, I did get one other question. Ooh. Um, they said, do you have an interoperability for, con well, a couple more. Yeah. Oh, Paul answers it. Never mind. There was another one though about um, what's the relationship between Fulcrum and QGIS? Like how does that flow work? Uh, Fulcrum is a commercial product that's got a lot of open source DNA in the back end. And so when Chad goes out to collect an address point, Fulcrum will actually push a GeoJSON feed out and we feed that directly into Fulcrum. Uh, I mean, uh, directly into QGIS. So when Chad takes a point, literally Chad could be out in the field taking a point. I've got that feed coming into QGIS. I see it almost, you know, within seconds after he takes the point. So, you know, in reality with two of us, he could go out and collect data and I can sit there and pull it in instantly into QGIS and then, you know, shove it over in the database. And I, I think there's probably hooks. I think uh, Fulcrum has some hooks to directly import in but we don't, we don't automatically pull that stuff in. I'd like to check it first before right. we you know, right. pull it in. So, yeah. Right. Cause you could write some sort of little software server that just yeah, takes, yeah, yeah. It right into and, and, yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, QField and, and, and input both have direct pulls out of QGIS. I mean, they're, they're plugins you can, you can dump out. So there's, you know, two years later after doing this, we've got myriad options for doing mobile data collection and That's you cool. know, do them all. So <laughs> right. Nice. All right. Yeah. Now we're really going to wrap up. Okay, folks. Okay, cool. Six minutes until our next one.